right. Well, <clears throat> I need a little grace from you this morning. I'm not feeling very well. Uh, my voice is giving me problems. I've, I've, I just feel weak, and I just don't feel like doing this today. So, I'm just going to throw that out there, to be honest with you. But, I'm going to act like it anyway, because it is what God has put within me to do. What we're talking about today is charity. Um, in the past couple of weeks, we've we've gone through the greatest uh, commandment. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. What's the second, which is equal to it? Love your neighbor as yourself. And then last week, we talked about the greatest sin. What is the greatest sin? Pride. 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 Yep. Now, this week, I want to talk about charity. And more specifically, I want to talk about the meaning of charity. Um, charity today, simply, it, it's, it's a replacement for the word alms. Everybody heard the, the word alms being used before? Giving alms to the poor or whatnot. Um, in Matthew 6, 1, in the King James Bible, it says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And then, in the American Standard Version, it says, Take heed that ye do not your righteousness before men, to be seen of them. Else ye have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And now the NLT, the New Living Translation, says, Watch out! Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. So alms, it's the same Greek word that's being translated through, and it's it's all within the the even though you've got you've got alms, you've got righteousness, and then you've got good deeds, it's all being translated within the use of the, the proper use of the word. But originally alms or charity, it could have several different meanings. It could be play you can play out your alms. You can play out your righteousness. You can play out your good deeds in several different ways. But in any of those ways, don't do it for public admonition. Don't do it just to receive praise. Don't do it just to be liked by others. Because when you do that, you will most assuredly lose that good reward from the Father. So, I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to clarify and distinguish between the act of charity and being charitable. Um, what, what's common to all poetry? A rhyme? Words? <laughs> Words, most assuredly. <laughs> but a rhyme? A rhyme is the most obvious part or aspect of a poem, right? Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you, right? Thank you. You're welcome, Eddie. <laughs> but it's but it's incorrect to say that anything that rhymes is a poem, right? You can just put a couple words together. So help me out here. What's a what's a rhyme? Any mini mini mo. Any is not a poem. <laughs> Mike, Sue, talk to him. No, I can't. I lost my shoe in the canoe. Not a poem. Not a poem. Uh, I can't think of a rhyme, so I'm and I'm running out of time. <laughs> but I can't think of a rhyme, and I'm running out of time. Is not a poem, is it? In the same way that a rhyme is not is, or I should say, the same way that a rhyme is the most obvious part of poetry, it in itself is not the whole of poetry. Charity, in the Christian sense, means love. But being charitable is not the same as being a Christian. Love, in the Christian sense, does not mean an emotion. As Christians, we may feel emotions of love, but so do non-Christians. In the same way, being charitable towards someone or some cause, it's a fine emotional response to have, but our acts of charity do not make us complete in Christianity, like a rhyme doesn't make a poem completely. Only Jesus is our completion. And true charitability 
It comes out of the will, the heart of that individual, not from a emotional response or through feeling. Although Jesus through or I, Jesus taught many things through his teachings. He he modeled it, he showed it, he lived it by example. So what we need to do as Christians then is to allow the teachings of God, the word of God, to mold our will to being his will. And once our will is his will, our charity is his charity. If our will is to just be kind, well that's nice, but it's not perfect. The perfection of God always trumps the good of this world. Good is good, but perfection is better. Amen? Amen. So in the Greatest Commandment sermons, uh, I explain that you don't always need to like yourself to love yourself. Remember? You don't always need to like what you do, but you still love yourself as a person. But loving ourselves does not mean um, that we are always... Uh, complacent or approving of the things that we do. It just means that we desire our good will towards ourselves. We are charitable to ourselves. We're hospitable to ourselves. We're favorable to ourselves. Uh, we provide for ourselves in ways that other people aren't, right? We need a new article of clothing. We go buy it. We need food. We go to Taco Bell. I mean, we provide for ourselves. Five dollar big box is a good deal. I'm not endorsed by Taco Bell. I'm open to it though. <laughs> but we, uh, in the same way that Christian love or charity for our neighbors is a very different thing from always liking or approving them. We can be charitable to them. We can love them. But it doesn't mean we like them. <laughs> not them as people. Them as their lifestyle or their choices their decisions. Not them as a person. We love them as a person in the same way we love ourselves. But we naturally like some people, don't we? And we don't always like everyone, do we? It's important to understand that this natural liking is not a sin or a virtue any more than your likes or dislikes for certain types of food is a sin or a virtue. My wife, when we met, couldn't stand seafood. On our cruise, I got her to eat shrimp cocktail. And she was like, oh, this is good. Like, yes, of course it's good. I thought her not liking shrimp was sinful. <laughs> but we're praying for her. But however we naturally feel for someone, it's not the issue. How we submit to the Lord's leading to love that person is the issue. We all have tendencies towards one or another. Some are uh, naturally, they don't agree with certain politics. So that person that subscribes to that political perception does, you know, they're evil <laughs> or vice versa. But however we naturally feel is not the issue. The issue is how we submit our natural feelings to the Lord. What we do about our feelings for them is entirely sinful or virtuous. Not the, uh, the, the natural liking of a certain person makes it easier to be charitable to them though, doesn't it? We want to be charitable even to the people that we like, but the people that we dislike, well, I'm not gonna be charitable to them. I, I, don't, like, I don't even like them, why would I do that, right? But for Christians, this is the question to love or not to love. As Christians, our duty is to love people as much as it is possible with the help of Jesus. Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now this, this passage, uh, I think it's a good uh, segue into looking at what's the most important commandment and this parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're going to read that. I did put it on the screens there for us. The most important commandment, 
One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that leads us into the explanation of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with oil, olive oil, wine, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If the bill rings, runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. As Christians, our, our duty to love people this is our greatest duty. It's to love people. And this, this duty to love people as much as possible. And you also get to experience the help of Jesus in that process. We don't need to do it on our own. And we don't need to do it according to what we think should be done. We get the help of God, which is awesome. Because sometimes I need some. I need some God help to love certain people. None of you here. Don't. <laughs> but I needed some help to love certain people in my life, in my past. It is also very necessary that we keep a very sharp lookout that our natural likings for someone does not make us uncharitable to someone else. What does that mean? I naturally like my friend Bill. Well, I have other people in my life, but I'm always giving to him and always loving on him, and I'm, I'm disregarding these others around me, even though they don't know God. Bill does. Maybe I'm being uncharitable to them by being overly charitable to him. Often our charity towards the person we like is in conflict with the charity that the Lord would desire to show through us. For example, I've got a question here. Who knows of someone who is spoiled? Okay. Many hands are up. Now, who knows of an adult who you highly suspect was spoiled as a child? Do they have a hard time keeping a good work ethic? Why? They've never had to earn anything. They've never had to work for anything. They've just been given everything. Oftentimes, these adults are still very much children and even a burden to their, children, their parents. The parents are still helping raise them up or bring them up. Proverbs 22, 6 and 9, 6 through 9 says, Train our... Just verse 6, I'm sorry. Train up the child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's not so uncommon today to see mothers who spoil their children. Um, you can rationalize with her as much as, as much as you can. 
You can tell her that she's going to be creating little monsters, that you shouldn't do this for society, this isn't good. But this mother is tempted by her natural affection for her child, and so she spoils him. She does this really only to gratify her own affection, her own affectionate impulses. And this comes even at the expense of that adult child's happiness. If natural impulses are not unchecked and they're not filtered through the Word of God and the character of God, we may end up hurting more than we help. Another thing to think about, uh, who knows anyone who's, uh, we'll say personality is very cold or stoic or in my case, German. <laughs> Anybody know anybody like that? Yeah? Okay. If you don't know me, I'll introduce myself to you later. Uh, but, but this is, it may be unfortunate for the person themselves, but they are, they are no more sitting in their natural tendencies to show emotion by being German than they are in having a visceral reaction to the Taco Bell they had at lunch. Being cold or being German, German-esque, in their emotional display does not remove them from the need. It does not give them an excuse out of the duty to learn charitability. Even though we may, me, speaking to myself, even though I may not want to show emotion, even though it's hard for me to show emotion. Unless I'm in the presence of God, then I'm a little baby. I, I like that, actually. But even though it may be hard for me to show emotion, it doesn't give me the excuse to not learn what emotions mean or are. Now, it would be wrong for me to force my stoic ways on somebody who's emotional in the same way that it would be wrong for somebody who's overly emotional to force their emotion on somebody who's very German. That happens, huh? believe it or not. The rule for all of us is simple. Don't waste time trying to figure out if you truly love your neighbor. Start acting like you really do. Just start acting like you love them. As soon as we start to find uh, or as soon as we start to, to live out this, um, hey, you know what, I'm making a decision today that I am going to show them an act of love. As soon as we start doing that, we'll find that we actually end up starting to love them. You will truly love them when you act like you love them. The opposite is true also. When you hate somebody, you will not show that you love them you will show that you hate them by not showing you love them. Right? Have you ever shown love to somebody that you hate? Do you even talk to the people that you hate? People hate people. Did you know that? Just turn on the news. The more we choose not to show love for them, the more we will hate them. But when we start acting like we love them, we will start to hate them less. There is a catch to all this, though. If you start acting like you love them, but you only show them love to receive gratitude, like in the passages we first read, if you're only wanting to receive gratitude back from them, not for the purpose, you know, I'm not showing them love to honor God or please God or follow His commandments, but if I'm only showing them love so that they'll return that gratitude back to me, then I suggest you just pull up a chair and sit down and wait. But you're going to be waiting for a long, long, long time. Because what did we say in the pride message? The more we see pride in others, our pride relax, uh, reacts with hate for their pride. They're going to find out that you're a phony. They're going to figure out real quick that you're just here to get some accolade or some praise or, you know, oh, you do charity work. Oh, yeah, great. Well, you're here on Monday and you're gone on Tuesday. 
They're going to see right through you. But when you love, and truly love, they'll, they'll see it as genuine love. Remember from the last two weeks, the pride in us hates the pride in others. Don't be surprised when you act in that way and only love to receive love back. Don't be surprised when they hate your pride. You might be thinking that this approach to just act like you love them, it sounds pretty cold. It sounds pretty outside of what true love really means. Maybe even it sounds like fake it till you make it. But showing Christian charity in this way, it may sound cold, but it's only going to sound cold to people whose heads are full of sentimentalities for people that they like, not people that they've been called to. Does that make sense? It may sound cold to somebody who's only concerned about with, with loving people that they like. This model of Show love even when you don't naturally love is quite distinct from the affection. Yet, it leads to true affection. It may seem like you're just kind of going through the motions. Like, okay, all right, I guess I'll sign up for the VBS, whatever. I mean, I'll do it, right? I mean, God loves me, I guess I can do. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. But then when you go and you start playing with the kids and you start acting like you love them and then they smile at you and they're like, hey, thank you for playing with me. You find out their situation. They don't have a dad. You're a man. You're playing with him as a dad. You start to have true affection. The difference between the worldly-minded and the Christian is not the difference between liking and loving. The worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not even have imagined liking himself at the beginning. The same spiritual law works in the opposite direction. We can look at history for this. Look at Germany pre-Nazi control. The Germans at first, they were told that the Jews were despicable, dirty people. They were <coughs> the scum of the earth. And for a time, this propaganda had just gone out. But it eventually led into the fascist Nazi Mindset. But during this time when they were just told, oh, Jews are nasty people, they're scum, they're filthy, whatever. Let's segregate them into their own ghetto. Let's, let's just kind of put them over here in this area. You know, yeah, you can still do business with them occasionally, but they're just, they're low-class people. Well, then all of a sudden, the, Jew, the Germans just started treating the Jews like low-class people. And then that low-class turned into, I hate you. You're a Jew, what? What? I'm not going to associate with you. No kids, you don't play with them. They're Jews. No, no, no. Then it turned into more aggression. Well, why did you look at me like that? Smack. It turned into more aggression. I don't want them living next to me. Shoot them. It turned into more aggression. Hey, let's get all them together. Let's put them on, let's put them on trains and let's send them off to death camps. The more you display the lack of love, the more you hate Good and evil both increase with compounding interest. This is why you and I need to take captive every decision to hate and turn it around to love. These moment-by-moment -moment decisions are, are of infinite importance and carry an eternal significance for those that we love or those that we hate. Even the smallest indulgence in lust or anger today is the foothold that the enemy needs and will use to launch an attack tomorrow. But let's, just, let's just go back and revisit charity for a second. 
Charity is not a word used exclusively to describe people's interactions towards one another. Charity is also a good descriptor for God's love for humanity. His love for us is charitable. As people, we are told that we ought to love God, right? Even if you don't believe in God, you've, you've been heard, or you've heard it said that you should love God, right? But what if you simply don't have any feelings of great love for God? What if you don't feel anything towards Him at all? I suggest first that you don't uh, know that He loves you. You haven't experienced His love for you in a way that you think uh, you should, right? But the answer is the same, especially, especially if you know that there's a good God out there somewhere and you want to have affectionate feelings for Him, but you just don't know how, the answer is the same as before. Just act as if you do. Ask yourself, if I did truly love God, what would I do to show Him that I loved Him today? He's got a Bible? Okay. I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to try reading this. And I'm going to try reading this as a good love talking, or a good father talking to me through love. Act like you do. Start acting like it. Christianity is not just a natural, like, boom in somebody's life. We grow in our maturity in Christ. And even though I don't feel like preaching today because I'm sick, I'm going to act like it because it's good. And the Word of God does not return back void. And we are edified by hearing the Word of God. So I'm going to act like it, and I'm going to feel great about doing it, because it's not about me. It's about me getting this vessel in line with the will of God for my soul. Right? And so, if you're trying to establish a relationship with God, and you just don't know what to do next, just ask yourself, if I really loved God, what would I do today? I suggest opening up the Bible and reading a little part and just meditating on that. Wow, okay. John 3.16. Start with something really, really obvious, really apparent, really uh, special. And just think about that. Meditate that out. Meditate that out throughout your life. Start with something simple and then build off of it. And these concepts of God that you hear preachers and other Christians, seasoned Christians talk about, they may not make sense to you in the moment of your, you know, just starting out the journey. But as you grow in Christ, these things build off of each other. And you start to experience the character of God in new, strong, fresh ways. His, new, His mercies are new every morning. Just ask yourself, if I loved God today, what would I do? What would I do about it? It's the same question that you ask about your neighbors. If I loved my neighbors, what would I do today about that? <laughs> if you don't know how to love God, read this scripture. 1 John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. It is much safer to think about how He loved us than the, and, and the completion of His love for us than it is for us to think about how we love God. Because if we're going to really sit down and have, a, have an honest approach at thinking through our love for God, we're going to be met with a lot of disappointment. Right? Man, I just did not love God well today. Holy cow, I'm a bad person. <laughs> I mean, I had an opportunity to, to show the love of God to somebody today, and I, I blew it. Like, we're going to be met with that. So it's safer and it's better for your mental stability to look at the love of God for us. His love is complete. It's not lacking. It doesn't need help from any other entity or source. His love is complete in Jesus Christ. Look at the cross. Look at how His love is complete. We can't know how God loves us unless we first know His love for us. 
No one person is going to always have the most pure feelings towards God. Did you know that? Even seasoned Christians, even, even people that are written about in scriptures, people like King David, if you've got your Bibles with you, if you've got your tablet or phone or whatever, flip open to Psalms 43. It's just five verses, real short. Flip open to Psalms 43 in whatever version you have. I'll read it here. You can read along with me in your own. This is David here. He says, Declare me innocent, O God. Defend me against these ungodly people. Rescue me from these unjust liars. For you are God, my only safe haven. Why have you tossed me aside? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by enemies? Send me out, or send out your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them lead me to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my heart, O oh God, my God. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Look, he's acting like it. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Even though David, right, he's written in the Bible, he's, his uh, life is accounted in, in the Holy Scriptures, he, he lives on even though he has passed away. His words live on, his actions live on, his life lives on in this text. Even a man like that, who the Holy Spirit said, we're writing this down about him. Even a man like him, who God said is after his own heart, got mad at God. He's mad at God. He's mad at, this doesn't seem fair to me, God. There's all these unjust liars around me. I thought you were loving me, God. Why am I going through this? Why don't you just rescue me? Send out your holy light. Let it be a guide to your holy mountain where you live. Like, what? come on, God. Like, do you, am I just, you know I love you. Why are you doing this to me? I don't understand this, God. God, when you fix this situation, then I'll worship you. Right there. There, I will go to the altar of God. Only God, only after God leads him to this mountain by his holy light, then I will worship you. But then he comes back around full circle in verse 5. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again. It doesn't say I will praise him. I will praise him again. What does that mean? It means he praised him once already. But he probably didn't feel like he was getting anywhere. So he's going to praise God again. Probably didn't feel like he was getting through. Like, I just don't get it, God. I just don't feel you right now. I'm going to praise you again. God, seriously, these liars that are around me, I don't feel you right now, God, so I'm going to praise you again. God, I'm just not getting it. But I'm going to praise you again. When you don't know what to do, act like it. When you don't know how to press into God, ask yourself, if I loved God well, what would I do? How would I love Him better? Then do it. Nobody can always have pure and devoted feelings for others and for God. And even if we could always have those good intentions, those good feelings, feelings are not what God particularly cares about. The choice to show Christian love is an issue of the will, not feelings. If we are trying to do His will, we are obeying the commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. If we as Christians today, those people who are devoted to God, if we are devoted in, to Him in all that we do and say and think and are, if we experience strong feelings towards charity, it's because He's given us those feelings. We can't create them for ourselves. 
We shouldn't just open a magazine of charities and flip through and say, oh, that one. Ask the Lord, God, what does your will have for my life today? How am I going to honor you? How am I going to praise you today? How am I going to love you? How am I going to be a good believer today? Starts with reading the Word. Starts with spending time in prayer. Starts by listening. You know, I've talked about feelings, and I don't want to cast it in a negative light. It's just that feelings are not meant to govern us. The Word of God is. Feelings can do great atrocities. Feelings alone is not a well-balanced person. You can feel a lot of different things in a very short moment, and none of those are right. But once you've worked through your feelings and gotten down to what is the consistent Word of God, what is His will, what is His character through His Word teaching us, that's what is meant to guide us, not our feelings. Our feelings are, I think, God-given us to show us that there's, a, there's something big happening right now. Like this situation, I need to respond to this situation. I'm mad. I'm angry. And rightfully so. Maybe you should be. So ask the Lord how to pray righteously through your anger. Don't just go off on a rant. Ask the Lord, how do I love them well today? Because you've loved me perfectly. Always go back to God. Even when you feel like you need to do something incredible, ask God what is creditable, not incredible. His love for us is the beauty of his love. I mean, just his love in itself. Just think about the depth of his love. It's not lessened for us by our sins. It's not, his love for us is not lessened by our apathetic ways towards him even. His love is, uh, it's indifferent towards our Actions. His love for us is, is greater than that. Because all of that stuff, all of our sins, all of our problems, all of our disappointments happened. Before we knew God loved us, He loved us. And we can't have, we couldn't have gone out and, and said, I, I love you God, before we knew that He loved us. But what we did do is we we lied, we cheated, we steal, we stole, we committed adultery in our hearts. We, we, all these things, all these commandments, we've broken every commandment before we knew God loved us. And yet He still loves us. His love for us is not lessened by our sin or our indifference towards Him. Instead, God's love is relentless in its determination that we should forever be cured of the cancer of pride and come, come into a lasting relationship with his internal love. Now, people always ask the question, and we kind of dealt with this a little bit on Wednesday night, but if, if God is such a loving God, how can he allow such pain and misfortune? I mean, if you say God's so loving, well, look at this. Look at this latest headline. Where's the loving God there? Look at, look at this... Um, Look at the example of my loved one who's in critical care right now. How can God love him? I mean, where's your loving God? Why doesn't your loving God just come down and heal everything? Take away all sickness. Take away all pain. Take away all affliction. Where's your loving God there? If you haven't heard anything else, listen. Listen. His love for us is relentless in its undying determination to forever cure us of the cancer of pride so that we might come into a lasting relationship with Him, whatever it may cost us, whether it costs us our job, whether it costs us our health, whether it costs us our wealth, whatever it may cost us, because it cost Him absolutely everything. Everything. It cost him his son's life. 
and we're off here kicking and screaming in our life, rebelling in our arrogant pride, thinking that God should do something, when in turn, He says, I already have. Repent. Why is God doing this? Why are you doing that? That's a better question to ask yourselves. Because none of us, to my knowledge, if you have, you know, please raise your hand. But none of us, to my knowledge, have created anything that hasn't already been created. None of us have spoken ex nihilo, which means something from nothing. None of you. I've said it before, but I'm going to muster up all the will I have right now to create a pink fluffy bunny with purple polka dots. Man, I can't do that. I just, I tried really hard, actually. I even stopped breathing. I was so intense. But I can't do that. So instead of asking the one who can do that and has done that, why are things going wrong? The better question is to ask creation, why are we rebelling against him? That's the better question to ask. That's a good question, right? God, why do you allow all these things to happen? That's a good question. But the best question is to say, am I loving God well? Am I showing my love for God well? And even when I don't want to, am I willing to try? Am I willing to say, I will put my hope in God, I will praise Him again? Maybe I didn't feel it the first time, but I'm determined I'm going to do it again. Amen? Megan, if you can come up. Everyone, if you'd stand with me, please. Thanks for letting me just come up here and act like this. But you know, I don't think we're done. You know, I've, I've, I've challenged in the past, and, and I mean it wholeheartedly, um, mostly because it was what was necessary for me. It was necessary for what, for what my journey to faith looks like. It was necessary for me and my um, it was necessary for me and my approach or my my pursuit of God. It was necessary for God to catch me in doing this. And sometimes growing up, I said it before, as a pastor's kid, you don't respond to an altar call. Like you're so your parent people might think something about your parents. People might think something about you. You're supposed to be perfect as a pastor's kid. Why in the world would you respond to an altar call? I just figured out real quickly that people that judge, they're just putting off the judgment they're going to get. Don't let that be what stops you from acting like it. Don't let that be what keeps you from coming into a true, deep relationship with God. Many Christians in America have an entitled perspective to say that I don't have to do anything because God's done it all for me. True. He's done it all for you. But how are you responding to His love? So I just, I want to open up the altars. Megan is going to play or maybe sing through a song. It's not a time of worship. It's not a time to, to take from God. It's a time to lay ourselves down and say, God, you know what? There's some stuff going on right now. And I don't feel like acting like it. But I will worship you again. I will come back. I will make myself. I will force this body to come in line with the will of God. And I will submit before you. Amen? So I just want to open up these altars. Um, just come. If you need to act like you love God today, then act like it. If you need to spend time in His presence and just sit there and not say anything, but just sit there in His presence, then do it. None of us are looking at you for that reason. Not at all. There's actually probably people that will see it, someone walk forward and say, I wish I could do that. Okay? So let's go forward now. Let's just respond to this. And let's just spend a few moments in His presence. Let's just love on God for a second. Let Him minister to us.